Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for Madison Square Garden this Saturday from a DFS perspective. Uh, tomorrow, I'm probably going to be doing the betting breakdown uh, as well for the same card. I'm actually going to be in attendance, uh, uh, barring any unforeseen circumstances. Uh, so that should be fun for me. And uh, hopefully again, as, as usual, all of these fights that are carded uh, hold. Uh, no cancellations, no DQs, no no contests, and boy, oh boy, you have 13 full fights. Uh, the chances that all 26 fighters get there into the octagon, we'll see what, how that uh, pans out. There could be some weigh-in issues, which will impact this slate, but uh, this is when I like to do these breakdowns. We did have one fight that was finally added to the salaries, um, this morning, so I was waiting on that, and that's it's a very important fight in the context of the slate. Um, first of all, you know, before I looked at the props and before we go through each slate, uh, each fight, I had, excuse me, I had what might be considered sort of a, a hot take on this type of, on this card, in that I, I think that it could be more low scoring than people would would anticipate. Um, you have a lot of big names and a lot of good fights, um, but I I feel as though there's as I go through this this card, there's like a couple of fights that are just kind of forced to deliver, but I don't think all of them do, a and it's very rare for a 13 fight card to expect low scoring, especially when you have fighters that people have heard of. Now they have added. Uh, kind of a premium play, which makes that take uh, maybe a little bit suspect, but uh, we'll see. The good thing again about a 13 fight card though, and I said this last week before I cursed it, uh, is that it allows you to you know, make good plays. In other words, you can get to the optimal lineup without sharing it with too many people when you have 13 fights, but it gets down to say, you know, 11, becomes very difficult, then you have to do all kinds of, of funny business with your construction, that being leaving money on the table, that being forcing in leverage when maybe it, it might not be that wise, uh, doing uh, geo mean filtering, using SaberSim, ending up with all kinds of like ridiculous lineups um, that don't really represent your, your takes on the fights, but in the, in the name of being unique, it's important that you have to you have to make those sacrifices. Um, but on a 13 fight card, I think we can we can play good plays. I think we don't have to do that much funny business. I'll end up doing some funny business with respect to my lineups, but not as much as usual. Let's put it that way. Uh, nonetheless, uh, let's just go through fight by fight and see what's what's going on here. Uh, first fight of the night. Now again, I don't know if these this order is holding, but. First fight I have listed is uh, Jamal Emers versus Dennis Bazooka. And you have Jamal Emers, who is the second highest priced fighter on the card. Um, let's actually sort these by fight number. I and mean, he's 9,400. And it seems like, well, I don't want to call it a misprice because when, when a guy is, is this uh, big of a favorite, relative to what everybody else is on the card, they're just going to put him as the highest price fighter. Now he's not the highest price anymore because they added Rebecca. Um, and, and that's the one thing that DraftKings does for better or worse is that they don't really take into account the, the upside of the fighter or the, you know, or the pace or, or, or anything like that. Um, they, they just really just price these things based on, uh, based on win odds. Um, so, because he was, I think, the second highest money line of the day at only minus 270, they priced him all the way up at 9,400. And in a vacuum, that is a very, very bad DraftKings price for this w money line. Uh, forgetting about whether he has a good inside the distance prop or, or anything like that. And when, when you dig deeper into this, you have Emmers as you know, a very, very poor inside the distance line at plus 210. I mean, at that price, he's got to have to be playable, really like minus 120, uh, minus 130 maybe, uh, or minus 110 plus wrestling upside. Now, 
Emmers does have wrestling upside. Um, he he dis, he displayed that in his last fight against Jack Jenkins. He took him down, I think, relatively handily. Um, the problem is he did not get the decision. Um, he was actually minus eight hundred as the fight ended, or so, and everybody thought he was going to win. He was also at home in in Florida, and somehow they gave the fight to Jenkins. So. Don't know if that's what Embers is going to do here. Um, so, in any case, it's a very, very difficult price tag to get to given these metrics. Now, as as always, this is an ownership based uh, sport. <laughs> well, I'm playing the, uh, GPPs in in daily fantasy sports, and I promise you that Embers is going to be extremely low owned, uh, especially for someone who's the second most likely fighter to win. And there are obviously there's going to be now two much better options surrounding him in the pricing uh, in the pricing structure. So I imagine he's going to be, you know, ten percent owned. And when you have a guy like that who does have um, wrestling upside, and he does have, oh boy, I don't even want to say it's a good inside the distance line. It's really it really is poor. But I have this weird feeling that be, because he lost that close decision in his last fight, um, he, he might be extremely aggressive in this one, like even more so than normal. Um, he's going to be the first fight of the night at Madison Square Garden. And even though you know Madison Square Garden is not going to be completely jam-packed for the first fight, they usually filter in. Um, I, I, I feel that Emrys is going to bring an extreme level of aggression to this fight and i think he does have upside here uh, we'll talk more about this when we do the betting breakdown I'm, I'm trying not to um put my opinion on the fight in in place of the of the lines here because according to the metrics this is an atrocious play okay it just is but i have to say that given the fact that it, has, it does have low ownership i think that uh, i'm going to be over the field on emerson now, the other side of this, Bazooka, um, you know, because his price is only 6700 this is a really good money line for him, you know. Um, usually, guys that are 6800 are maybe have 20% winning chances, but this guy is, is you know, about 30% winning chances here, and at 6800 that's pretty good. Um, but what it, what it, the question that it brings up is what type of underdog do we really need on a slate like this? Do we need, are we okay with just getting a win or do we need a win with leverage with upside? Um, now I'm going to contradict something I said is that even though I think that it's a going to be a lower than expected, um, scoring slate, I do think that you still need to prioritize underdogs with upside and underdogs that are facing fighters that are highly owned. And Bazooka does not uh, fit those, uh, those criteria because his inside the distance line is extremely poor, like plus 600. And as I mentioned, Embers is going to be really low owned. So there's really no reason to play Bazooka to get any leverage. So this first fight, I am going to be over the field on Embers and that's going to be probably a pretty, I want to say hot take or it's freaking hot take and stuff, whatever. But uh, but I do think that that's uh, it's it wasn't what I was expecting to do when this fight card came out. The more I think about it, I think it makes a lot of sense, especially since they they added Rebecca. Now you have both Rebecca and we have Rebecca Dern and what's his name, uh, Saint Denis, that are going to take all of the ownership and if those if those guys bust or or if even one of them busts or you know whatever or if you have lineups that that play um frivola or or andrage or something like that um and let's say rebecca you know gets there but you know it's a dominant win or even has a first round knockout that scores him you know 105 points or something like that um, I think I think Embers is it was a good bit of leverage. All right, moving on. Uh, that's a lot on that fight. Uh, Joshua Van versus uh, Kevin Borgas. Uh, 
he is another one who is priced above 9K who is going to take very little ownership. Because um, you look at this, I mean, his, his, he's only a minus 240 to win. And again, on normal slates, you can, you can, you can get away with, you know, guys like that at like 8,700. But now because there are very, so few fighters that have big winning odds, uh, big win odds that they have to price him up over 9K. So you look at him, what is his actual price? 9,200. And this is usually a terrible, not a great, great bit of win odds for 9,200. So he's really got to make up for it with a big, big time inside the distance line. And he doesn't really have it. I mean, it's, it's certainly better than than Emmer's. It's plus 150. Um, but relative to his price, I mean, that's really not great. Um, the only way you can make up for that is if he had a lot of grappling upside. Now, I have heard that he does have some submission upside. Um, and I guess it's possible that Van goes for it. But according to the metrics, it's probably it's probably just about a similar type play as Ebers. Maybe a little better, um, but not much. But again, the same argument I would have for him is that he's surrounded by people in the pricing structure that are going to be three times as highly owned, at least. Um, so, you know, at 10% or so ownership, a plus 150 inside the distance with maybe some grappling upside is enough for me to, to play him at, at, you know, as a very, very high leverage pivot. Um, not high le well, he's not leveraged against the pony. He's leveraged against other fighters in his tier. Okay. That's an important distinction. Now, the other side of this is actually pretty interesting because you have Borg Borgas, who is, only 7K. Now, he doesn't have any leverage because, as I said, Van is not going to be highly owned, but he does have decent win odds here, that being, you know, plus 185 or so at his price. That's not bad. Not to mention, he's got a, a sneaky little good inside the distance line here. I mean, a plus 285. Plus 285 is very reasonable, to say the least, for a guy in this price range. So I'm going to play him, um, and it's it's a weird way to start off the card because you have five or six or seven just incredible fights to close out this card, and to, to waste you know your, your lineup spots in these first two fights with guys with terrible metrics and then the Kevin Boras just feels wrong, but but the the fact that it feels wrong probably means that so few people are going to do it that I think you're going to have to try this. So to start off with, again, I like Embers in the first fight, probably fade Bazooka. And I do like both sides of this man Borges fight in GPPs. All right. Uh, now, again, that the, I do have to kind of uh, make this distinction. You know, when, when I say I like him in GPPs, I mean the big lottery turn. Like if you're 20 max and below, I probably don't play Van at all. I probably don't play Embers at all. The Borgas play, uh, I might play. All right. Uh, next fight, Mr. Perfect, Kyung Ho Kang versus John Castaneda. Pretty closely lined fight, so I imagine the price should be something like, I don't know, Castaneda 8,400, 8,300, something like that. Let's take a look. Wow. 8,800 to 7,400? So we've got a little bit of line value here on Mr. K. Um, I that's a significant about that's a significant degree of line value actually. Um, some of the well, it depends where you look here. 140, 130. At the very least, I would consider this good line value. How about that? It could be premium line value. And John Castaneda on the other side is very poor line value. So for Castaneda to be a good play. He would either have to have a uh, really super strong inside the distance line, or Kang would have to be pretty highly owned. Now, it's possible that both of those things are the case. We'll get into Castaneda's inside the distance line in a minute, but with this money line value, is it possible that Kang becomes popular? 
I don't think so, only because as we get to some of these other later fights, it's going to be so easy to build these mid these mid range fight uh, constructions with guys that you like. And I don't think people are going to play these guys down low to the degree to make them leverageable. Um, let's just take a look. Let's take a look at the, uh, at the metrics here. Castaneda inside the distance, plus 235. That's just not going to work for me at 8,800. Um, Kang inside the distance, plus 400. That's not going to work either. So I, I, I think that if anything, I would play Castaneda because – it is possible that can get some ownership here, maybe. Um, so, so you get a little bit of leverage, and again, he's. I think Castaneda has got to be. I mean, how, who's going to play him at eight eight hundred with bad line value, when when it's uh, when it's a card basically that's making you play eighty two hundred eight K fighters. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, if anything, maybe I'll play some some Castaneda. Probably not going to get to Kanyo Ken. Jared Gordon versus Marco Madsen. Um, Gordon minus 190, minus 200. So he's going to be another $8,900 guy, I imagine. We'll take a look. Yep, yeah, 8,900. So for 8,900, he's going to need an inside the distance line of about, I don't even need minus 110. How about like plus 110? Maybe plus 120 even, something like that. And you look at it, it's just atrocious. I mean, it's just a terrible, terrible line here. It's just, just you can't play him. Uh, on the other side of this, you have Mark Madsen, and and what he has going for him is that his he's got definitely quite a bit of takedown upside. Um, he is an Olympic wrestler, silver medal winner in Greco, I think Greco Roman was a freestyle. I'm not sure. Nonetheless, uh, he's had moderate amount of success in the UFC uh, trying to. Uh, translate his olympic wrestling to this um he's had some cardio issues he's also had a fight recently where he abandoned the wrestling and won a kind of a boring striking battle so um he's not gonna show up as as a great inside the distance line we'll look at it's probably gonna be plus 800 or something like that we'll take a look uh yeah plus 550 but if in fact he does win it's going to be because number one, he got the takedowns, and number two, the judges didn't punish him for it. You know, because what the judges love to do nowadays is punish grapplers if they get takedowns and do nothing else with them. And Mark Mats, and that's what he does. He gets takedowns and does nothing with them. So, you know, it's possible that you get Mark Madsen with like six takedowns and you're thinking you're smashing, and the next thing you know, they give the they give the the decision to Gordon because Gordon just had more significant strikes or just had the better strikes in general. So, however, though, we're we're presuming for the purposes of DFS that he's going to win, right? So, like, if he wins, it would be because he either got the takedowns and got finished somehow, or got the takedowns and the judges gave it to him. Now, again, you have a lot of stuff going against you here if you play Madsen because you have Jaron Gordon who is coming off of two just tough, tough scenes, man. Like two fights ago, he got basically robbed of a decision against Patty Pimblett. And his last fight, he was actually winning the first round, I think, against Bobby Green before he got headbutted and, and, and you know, got the, you know, like, well, he got KO'd sort of when he got headbutted and got knocked out that way. Um, so I, I do think that all else being equal, I mean, if Madsen does go for takedowns and doesn't do anything with them, the judges will do everything in their power to give it to Jared Gordon. So you're not allowed to complain if you play Madsen and um, and you don't get the decision. But I do think you have to play him in DFS because in DFS, you're not allowed really to give your opinion on what's going to happen. or You're not allowed to give your opinion that he can't get the decision because we're presuming that he's going to get the decision. <laughs> you know, he's going to get the decision, what, 40 like 35% of the time. And if he does, it's just going to score well. It just is. So I think Madison's a, Madison's a very good, a pretty good uh, GPP play. Um, it's actually pretty good, I think, actually in, in the 20 max as well, because it might not be as good of a, of a lottery play for the only reason that Gordon is not going to be particularly popular. So you, you get the takedowns, you get the scoring upside, but you don't really get the leverage upside. But I do think he's good for kind of low risk. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he's good for cash, really. But maybe. 
you know, I don't really play cash, but if you have a guy who's going to get takedowns, maybe he gets there at a loss, you know, something like that. Okay, moving on, we have Nazim Sadikov versus Vyshislav, that's not the way you pronounce it, whatever, Borshev. Um, pretty closely lined fight. You have, I guess, minus, minus 130, minus 125, so I imagine it's going to be 8,400-ish for Sadikov. A little more, 8,500, tiny bit of line value on Borshev, which which is which is good because uh, uh, I think what's... I, with respect to the inside of distance lines and stuff, I think that um, Sadikov has the edge. We'll take a look at this. Sadikov inside distance at 8,700. Is that what he is? 8,600? Let's see what he is. He's plus 145? That's pretty That's pretty reasonable. I mean, you think about this. I mean, he's got a better inside the distance line than Joshua Van. He's got a better inside the distance line than, than Jamal Emmers at 9,400. He's got so far the best inside the distance line we've seen. And he's only 8,600. I mean, this is a pretty premier play. I mean, not to mention the fact that he might have grappling upside here. I mean, he does have grappling upside if he chooses to go for it. So he's a very, very strong play, all formats. Um, Borshev plus 230 inside. I think that's pretty reasonable. Uh, I think this is a pretty, I think this is a pretty decent target as well. So this is one of a couple of a kind of mid-range fights that are are very, very good to target both sides. So I, I like Sadikov and I like Borshev. All right. Uh, I alluded to this fight before. You have Mateus Rubeski versus Roosevelt Roberts. Roosevelt Roberts is here on short notice, and Rubeski is a minus 600 favorite, and he has been priced to 9,600, which is – Good on DraftKings for doing this because I thought they were going to slide him in at 9,300. If they put him in at 9,300, he would have been 70% owned. At least at 9,600, it it's, creates kind of a decision because as I mentioned, you know, there's very little on this card with a big as uh, that that indicates a big favorite. Like the highest price favorite oh, below him is what was it? Was Emmer's like minus 250. Um, so you have this is your premier play. You have Rebeski at night at Minus six hundred, and now for ninety for ninety six hundred dollars in salary, you're gonna need a huge inside the distance line, and he's got it, man. He's he's minus two hundred inside the distance, which is pretty good, uh, to say the least. Not only that, but he also has grappling upside. So this is this is a really really strong play. Um, is he gonna get there in ninety six hundred? Who knows? It's possible that he gets you know that he gets a takedown and a finish in the first round. And gets 115, and maybe that's not even enough. But again, I think that this card is is not going to deliver as much as people think. So getting Rebecca and getting that 110, if that's in fact what happens, it's not like these other cards where you're where where you're really really worried about the 110 winning. I think the 110 is gonna is gonna be good. Okay, so I think that Rebecca is a uh, very super strong play. Um, Gonna, I imagine he has to be really popular, but you know, on, on a card like this, without a lot of huge favorites and without a lot of huge inside the distance line, I, I think this is a, I think in cash games and anything low risk, you have to play him honestly. Um, uh, on the other side, Roberts, unfortunately, listen, he's gonna, he's got a, a ton of leverage, right? Because if Rebecca can get to be sixty percent owned or whatever it is. God forbid Robert Roberts gets the dub. I mean, that's like huge, but he's not going to win just too often. He's going to win like 15% of the time. And that's, that's kind of rough. So I'll probably avoid it. Tabitha Ricci versus Lupito Godinez. You have Godinez. I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're slow getting up here, but the, I think these are all very interesting fights to analyze. You have Tabitha Ricci versus Lupito Godinez, uh, two, uh, two fighters who can wrestle. Uh, Tabitha Ricci has been more committed to that game plan than, than Godinez. Godinez has found success both on the feet and wrestling. She's also found some struggles when she's been on the feet, but definitely think she's the more well-rounded fighter or fightress or whatever. Nonetheless, you have minus 175 plus 145, so I imagine it's about 8,800 as far as the price goes. And uh, yeah, that's about it, 8,700, 7,500. 
Um, inside the distance line for Godinez, you're probably not going to get anything great. Uh, let's see. Godinez inside plus 375 is atrocious. Ricci plus 650 is atrocious. Okay. So who? what are we going to do here? You know, I, I, Godinez's upside in the in the absence of a strong inside the distance line is going to be if she decides to go for takedowns and and that she's successful at them. This is Ricci's specialty. You know, she's very good jujitsu. She's a good wrestler herself. So I don't know if that's what Godinez's best plan is. I think Godinez is probably her best plan is just to really keep this on the feet and. Uh, Lupita Godin is very strong. She, she. I don't think that Ricci is going to be getting a bunch of takedowns on her. So, uh, I think the Godinez's is best pass to victory is one that doesn't really score all that all that well. The problem is, and this is where it, it's weird, is that Godinez has been known to do that which is unexpected. <laughs> there's been there's been fights where she's supposed to wrestle and she stayed on the feet. So if, if people are accusing her of having bad fight IQ, it's possible that she should she's going to actually just go for all these takedowns. Um, and if in fact she gets away with it, if she is a better wrestler than Ricci, then she listen she she could smash here. But I, I think that those types of of fights are going to end up busting as opposed to smashing. Okay, they'll end up with everybody fighting to get takedowns, nobody really getting anything. And then a whole round is wasted, you know, without a lot going on. Um, the, unfortunately, the, the, the side that, that the only side that I feel really confident in, in DFS is going to be Ricci because, again, you know, I'm not saying that she can win or she's going to win. I'm not saying that she can get all these takedowns on Godinez, but I, I don't see her winning without them. Um, actually, that's not exactly true. I mean, like, I guess Ricci could win. She could win by submission, maybe. Like, if Godinez gets the takedowns and, and Ricci's good off her back or something. But um, I think the only way Ricci does win is if she gets takedowns of her own. And that's going to include, I mean, she's going to have to really get a bunch of, or really do a lot with them. And she's just not that type of fighter. It's, I have to say, it's, it's, it's a, it's a struggle to make this play, but I think the Ricci side, it's very similar. I shouldn't say that. I was about to say it's very similar to the uh, Madsen side. Um, I guess it is right. Because I don't really see Madsen winning with his style, but if he does win, it's going to be because his style worked. Right. And I don't really see Ricci winning like this, but if she does, because her style works. So yeah, okay. So I'm going to throw Ricci in along with Madsen in in my plays. Uh, again, I, I don't. My opinion is that Kodinius just keeps it on the feet and stuffs the takedowns if Ricci tries them and just wins kind of an easy decision that busts. But again, we have to figure out what happens if I'm wrong. You know what I mean? Like, because because Ricci is supposed to win this fight about forty percent of the time, um, and in that forty percent. She's going to score well, I would think, um, especially for 70, 7,500. Because even if she doesn't do a lot with the takedowns, whatever, she still is good for 80, 85. And at 7,500, that's not bad. So grudgingly, ouch, I, I guess I'll play some Ricci and hold my nose and don't play Godinez maybe. I don't know. That's that's tough because I've seen Godinez rack up the points here, but it's weird. I'm gonna rely on Godinez to do the right thing. And if she does, I'm not gonna want to play her. Because if she does the right thing, she's not gonna go for the grab leg. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move on. Uh Urseg versus uh Costa. Let's take a look at the uh the line here. You have Urseg and uh, minus 190. So uh, on this Slate, we're talking about probably an $8,900 fighter, maybe 9K. So let's see. Yeah. Ooh. He's only 8,600. All right. So that that's, I think, a pretty decent bit of line value here. 
Um, yeah, at eighty six hundred minus one ninety. Well, I don't know. It's not much better than Godinez, I guess. It's better. It's not. It's not even as good as as as. It's just as good of a money line as Gordon, and he's three hundred less. Does that make some sense? So okay, so Ekreg's got some got some got some line value, right? That's something. Let's take a look at the inside the distance lines here. So Ekreg, that's the way you pronounce it. Inside the distance plus one seventy five at eighty six hundred. I guess that's okay. You know what I mean? Like I guess that's okay. Uh, you you combine that with the line value a little bit. I think he's reasonable. Don't think he's a smash play or anything like that, but but I definitely think he's reasonable. Costa plus three fifty inside, just not quite good enough for seventy six hundred. So Costa is probably going to be a fade. The only thing I'm worried about is again if Ekreg ends up being popular because of that money line value. Like if Ekreg goes up to like minus two twenty by the time the fight fight goes off. Then you might get some, uh, you might get some some uh, some leverage on Costa. So so yeah, I'll, I'm going to leave Costa in my in my underdog. All right, so now we're at the main card, and we're at all kinds of of good stuff here, all kinds of great fights. But remember, just because they're great fight, fights doesn't necessarily mean they're good DFS fights. Uh, some of them are, some of them might not be, but whatever. And it's tempting to just kind of play these fights. Because, like, for example, I'm going to be at the, I'm going to be here. It's very tempting for me to say, okay, I'm going to fade everything else. I'm going to play the six fights on the main card. <laughs> it's like, uh, play the Ekrang fight, the Lobe 17 fight, whatever, and just be just, and just enjoy myself. Root, for, root against, root against everything else for the rest of the night, and just play these top six fights. But that's just not, you know, that's that's not particularly analytical. Uh, all right, so Sabatini versus Diego Lopes. You have. Uh, Sabatini, 8,300. So I guess he's going to be you know, minus 120, something like that. We'll take a look. Yeah, about that. So no real line value here. You have a, we have a battle between two grapplers. Um, Lopes is a little bit, well, certainly a better striker. And Sabatini is the better wrestler. But Lopes is really, really strong off his back with submissions. So there's a lot of, a lot of contrasting styles here. Let's take a look at the... Uh, the uh, first, let's look at the inside the distance line. I imagine that Lopes is a better inside the distance line. Yeah, so Lopes plus one forty five inside the distance. That's that's pretty strong for his price. And Sabatini's inside the distance line is not too bad for his price. And Sabatini is the one that's got the grappling upside. Uh, not the grappling upside, the wrestling upside. Uh, Lopes certainly is a better grappler. I mean, he's got better submissions, but. Sabatini is going to be the one to get the takedowns here because quite honestly, Lopes doesn't even mind getting taken down. So uh, I think both sides of this fight are uh, very, very playable. And I would target this fight and I would play both sides. Um, so maybe I will do this. Maybe I will play these first six, these last six fights. Uh, all right. This next fight, actually the next four, I mean, this is, this is there. This is, it could be, there's definitely fireworks here. So you have, I've been to now, this is going to be my third UFC card I've been to. And it will be my third UFC card where Matt Frivola is fighting. Um, uh, you have, oh, and that's not true. I don't think I, yeah, yeah, it is true. Uh, I saw him fight Ottoman Ozatar. And Ottoman Ozatar was the one that had all the knockout upside. And they were saying that Frivola, if he's smart, he will avoid getting into a slugfest. He will go to his grappling because he's chinny. And if, you know, and, and if he gets into a slugfest, Azatar was going to knock his block off. Bravoli didn't care. He got into a slugfest and he just destroyed him. <laughs> he just knocked him out in the first round. So then the next time he fought was in New Jersey and he was up against Drew Dober. All right. Now, Drew Dober has the iron chin. Okay, so it's impossible to knock out Drew Dober. So they were saying the exact same thing. Listen, even though for Volna knocked out Ozatar, if he gets you into a war with Dober, 
he's just not, this is not what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to get into, he's supposed to go to his grappling and whatever. He got into a slugfest with Joe Tober as a two to one favorite and knocked him into oblivion. Okay. So this is two fights in a row. Okay. That, that Frivola has been kind of like warned. He said, I don't give an F and just took the guy's head off. He's got an, this is like an amazing fight because he's against Benoit St. Denis, who is just, just nonstop. I don't give an F. Right. He doesn't care if he gets hit. He took an insane beating from uh, Dos Santos several fights back, but it's just impossible to kill this guy. And then he came back with an enormous win as an underdog against, uh, I think it was Bonfim. Um, just, obliterated him. And then he came against a, a very, very seasoned veteran, I think Tiago Moises, uh, and just outgrappled him and submitted him as well. So these guys are going to to war. Uh, and in a war, uh, I uh, there's no way that I'm going to let, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have Frivola. I don't know what to say. He's plus 185. Now again, the other side of this, saint I mean, he's obviously an extremely elite play. I mean, you look at this, you have Dede inside the distance is minus 130, okay, which is really strong. He also has a lot of takedown upside, so that's really strong. It's going to be a high-paced fight. That's really strong. But there's no way that I am not playing for Bowley, you know, as well. So I'm going to be playing both sides of this fight. Uh, I It's very likely that I lock this one in. This is probably the only fight that I see that's like guaranteed to deliver a big score. Um, I shouldn't say that, but, but, but that's to me what this, this fight is just going to be just attack. That's the best I can describe it. Uh, and that's, this is clearly the fight. of the night. Anyway, uh, I want to have both sides of this. And, and that's just the bottom line there. Mackenzie Dern versus versus Jessica Andraj. I don't want to get into my opinion on this fight. I really don't. I'm going to save this one for the betting breakdown. I'm just going to look at this from a uh, from the numbers perspective. You have Dern; he's my, she's minus 200. You have Andrade; she's plus 160. So I guess the price should be, given the way this slate is, probably Dern about 9100. Uh, I think that's what she is. She's 9k. All right. So for 9k, what you need is an inside the distance line of about minus 110 uh, and, or a, a, a significant amount of takedown upside. So we'll take a look at this, and you'll see Dern inside the distance is minus 110. So that's a perfectly good play. And she does have some takedown upside. She's not really a wrestler. She's a grappler, so she could get takedowns. She did against Angela Hill. Angela Hill, she had all kinds of control time and all the all the wrestling and grappling uh, DraftKings points you can find. He scored like 160 points or something like that. Um, but she's usually not really a wrestler per se. She'll go for submissions. She'll jump on your back or whatever. Um, and Andrade on the other side, she's lost three in a row. To, it's very, very difficult competition. Um, she's now an underdog here. And her path to victory is keeping this thing on the feet. Uh, and quite honestly, she, if she does that, she's going to come probably with some good volume and or a knockout. So I think that Andrade is is very, very live here. Again, I don't want my opinion on whether she, she's done or whatever. I'm just looking at the odds. She's plus 160. She's 7K, and she's and she does well in a win, and Dern's going to be popular. I think you just have to play Andrade here. All right. Um, Pavlovich Aspinall. This could be the fight that is extremely popular that busts. It could be. There's nothing about the metrics that suggest this, but I'll just you know, I'll make my case in a second. So you have two heavyweights who basically just win everything in the first round, and you have a basically a pick 'em fight. You have yeah, it's 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 pick 'em. Maybe you have a slight favorite in Aspinall. Uh, 8,200, 8K. And you look at the inside the distance line, it's just, you know, it's just ridiculous. You have, was it both fighters plus 160 or something like that? Let's see. Um, let's see what we got here. Avlovich inside plus 100. 
Aspinall minus one ten. You know what I mean? Like this fight is finishing. That's what they're that's what they're saying. Um, the inside the distance line is like minus two thousand or something. Uh, by the way, it was minus three thousand last week with Almeida and Lewis. You saw what happened there. Nonetheless, according to the metrics, you just don't want to fade this fight. You know, uh, it's it's very likely. I don't say likely, but you have Aspinall to win in round one plus two hundred. Uh, Pavlovich went around one plus 200, so 33% of the time, like either of these fighters, you know what I mean? Like this, this 33% of the time, let's put it this way, Pavlovich scores over 100, right? 33% of the time, Aspinall scores over 100. So 67% of the time, someone here is scoring 100. Uh, very difficult to fade. Um, and, and, and because of that, it's going to be really popular. I just want to say this, all right, that if, in fact, Aspinall wants to. Now, again, neither of these fighters have made it past the first round, really. I mean, Aspinall got to the second round with, I think it was Orlovsky or whatever, and got him out there early in the second round. If Aspinall were smart, and, and I've heard he has a very, very acute, very strong fight IQ, what he will do is stay away from this guy <laughs> and essentially just outspeed him and dance around for five rounds and beat him up and, and, and outpoint him. Okay. Um, if that in fact happens, obviously the fight busts at huge ownership. I don't see a version where Pavlovich wins that the fight busts. That's the problem. Um, in in low risk or anything like that, you you just have to play this. But in the in the in the lottery, in the GPP, in the one where you need to beat a hundred million people, I think you can make a case to fade this fight, just because of the ownership, and just because, like you said, we've never seen these fighters out of the second out of the first round. But maybe just maybe, if this fight does make it out of the first round. You end up with those slot that sloppy heavyweight fight that people fear. You know, it's usually in, in the low level heavyweights that we fear this, but it's possible that if neither of these guys are significantly better than the other at getting the guy out of there in the first round, that this fight ends up busting. It's possible. Um, so I, I guess I'll leave you with that with that thought. Okay, uh, Yuri Prohaska versus Alex Prahea in the main. Of, and by the way, I have no, I have no opinion between these two fighters. Pavlovich maybe has a little more round one KO upside. Aspinall probably has some more grappling upside. I, I really don't see much of a difference. Prohaska, uh, Prahea, five rounds, eight K, eighty one hundred, whatever these guys are. Prahea is at minus one twenty five and. A little, little bit of line value, I guess, in Prohaska, but not really. And you have five rounds to work with. Um, and I think that's actually pretty important in this fight. Uh, I think this fight can go five rounds rather easily, actually. I shouldn't say easily. Prohaska just has a lot of cardio. He can get there. And Pejea, maybe not as much. I think Pejea's path to victory is more KO-based. than Pro I think Prohaska can win a decision. Maybe a little bit better than Pahaya, especially if, if Prohaska somehow invents like takedown upside in this fight somehow. Um, but let's just take a look at the inside the distance line. It's obviously pretty strong. I mean, you have uh, what do we have here? We have Pahaya inside the distance is plus 100. I mean, that's insane. I mean, that was insane. It's really good for an $8,300 fighter. Prohaska inside the distance plus 135 is really good for 7,900. You also have five rounds to work with. But the other thing to think about is that is that just because someone's minus 110 inside, go inside the distance, remember, if, if Pahaya finishes him in, in round four, which he could do, I mean, did he? I think he knocked out, uh, what's his name, in round five, right? Uh, Izzy in round five. Uh, if that happens... You know, and, and Pahaya basically just has a, you know, a nice kickboxing fight. He ends up knocking him out in the fourth round. The inside the distance line hits, but Pahaya might bust. Maybe he wouldn't bust. I mean, maybe he'd only get like 90, but that's not guaranteed to, to get there, especially considering because the main event, it's going to get highly owned. 
So, uh, yes, the metrics suggest that you should play both of these fighters. And I really don't have an opinion on which one. So it really depends on what type of contest you're in, as usual, as to what you want to do in this fight, uh, in this card. If you want to be very conservative, you'll play both sides of the Prohaska Pahea fight. You'll play both sides of the Pavlovich Aspinall fight. You'll play both sides of the Frivola Santini fight and just kind of work from there. You know, uh, maybe you could try Madsen as an underdog, maybe Ricci as an underdog, and you're going to want to play Rebecca. Okay. So uh, what's going to end up happening is you're going to get Rebecca with kind of the, 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 the lower end of these. I think Frivola will take money. I think that, that, the lower price of these Prohaska will take money. Like, for example, I'll show you, like, this is what a, a, a lineup could look like. You could play Rebecca. And again, since nobody really cares about these, about which guy to take here, you'll take Prohaska, you take Pavlovich, and let's just say you take, you know, uh, Frivola. Like, this, this is, this is easy, easy money. You know what I mean? Like, this is an easy way to play. You don't even have to do this. You could play even, Santini and play some of these reasonable underdogs over here like this you play lopes you know whatever you know so so this is the type of construction that makes a lot of sense and it's going to also be very very highly owned okay so you play stuff like this and like the 555 or the or the you know the, the single entries and stuff like that but if you really want to get frisky then you'll do stuff like play Jamal Emmer's Joshua Van, you know, by the Sadikov, he was another good player. You play Tabitha Ricci, you know, the, those those are going to be, and and maybe fade the the Aspinall, or maybe fade the the uh, the Prohaska. I'll tell I'll tell you what could be a pretty strong underdog here is this is this Andrade. I think Dern's going to take money. Jern was going to be much more popular, by the way, until Rebeski was added to the card. Um, but it really does depend on what type of what type of contest you're entering. You're entering. Hopefully that, but that helped you more than it confused you. And stay tuned for tomorrow, where we'll go through the betting breakdown, uh, which is a lot more fun. Uh, see you then.